All right. Hi. So uh, as Kayla mentioned, I'm Chris Mentrick from the Geauga Park District. And I normally work at a place called Observatory Park, which is uh, all about astronomy engagement, making sure there's uh, people can come out and visit a nice uh, dark spot for uh, stargazing and there are public viewing nights and a planetarium and whatnot. But we also wanted to uh, share uh, some tips on how you could observe the moon from home, particularly if you're going to be borrowing the binoculars or telescopes that the, uh, the library loans out. We're going to be talking all about the moon. Oh, nicely done. And how you can learn a little bit more about it. Some uh, good stuff that's coming up, particularly next month. So uh, you uh, may or may not have chosen to attend uh, a moon-related uh, feature this October for a reason. But you, uh, regardless, you chose a good month because something nifty is kind of happening with the moon next month. So um, enough of looking at me. I'm going to do my very best to share uh, some photos with you. Stand by one while we try and share the screen. All right. Ooh. So we started off with this uh, not so interesting, but sort of remarkable snapshot that I took of the moon using a, a telescope almost identical to the one that the library loans out. So this is the very high tech procedure of holding your cell phone up to the uh, telescope eyepiece and snapping a photo. And not just gonna sh to show you uh, some of the things you can see through a, a telescope of that style, but also to give you sort of a uh, mini quiz here. There's something interesting and unusual going on with the moon in this photo. Other than the fact that it's a little bit hazy because it was slightly cloudy when I took that photo. But we will come back in a bit and find out a little bit more uh, about what makes this photo unique. Because by the time we're done tonight, you are gonna be uh, your neighborhood's uh, amazing expert on the moon and uh, observing it all through its cycles. So like we said, I normally work at Observatory Park, and if we were in person, I'd you know, do a show of hands to see who or has or has not visited Observatory Park in Montville, but I'll put in a plug. Uh, we're always happy to have folks out there. Uh, it's open for self-serve astronomy every night of the year, and uh, about six times a month, we do uh, public viewing nights, and it's always free and open to everybody. All right. But what we're going to be doing tonight is going over some tips about when you can look for the moon, because uh, that's something we get asked a lot by uh, observing uh, beginning astronomers. And it's a question I had a lot when I was beginning. It's when, it, when is a good night to actually look for the moon? And what, uh, what time of the month is uh, a good time? What phase is the moon in right now? So uh, we're going to cover what to know about the moon and where you might find more information about it. We're also going to cover some special events involving the moon, like eclipses and stuff, and then a few other uh, good resources for more information. So on to the good stuff. Ooh, moons. Uh, and I'm showing you a, a fast forwarded picture of the moon cycle here. We get a, a moon cycle every moon. And a lot of us, especially me, tend to forget that the modern concept of a month is based all around the moon because it takes the moon about 29 days or so to go through its cycle called its phases. What we're showing here uh, sped up in this picture. And so folks long ago seized on the fact that, well, this cycle takes about 29 days. That's a great way to divide up uh, your time of the year. And so, yeah, you can use it to keep track of what's going on uh, in, in time by just dividing your year up into moons, into fractions based on the moon cycle. But to condense it all into one picture, here's this handy graphic, which you'll see in a lot of astronomy textbooks, and it shows, ah, the phases of the moon. And for most of us, this is something, you know, we uh, had, were forced to memorize back in elementary or middle school, where you encountered amazing words like waning gibbous, and then are quizzed on what those words mean. But the way it's often presented to, to children, we don't really retain when you can look for uh, the moon or when you're going to see it. If the moon is waning gibbous, so what? Does that mean we're going to see it in the daytime, in the nighttime? Is it a good time to look at the moon? So uh, I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about uh, these moon phases. Ooh. And the other great thing I love about the fact that we're now in the 21st century and we're uh, talking to each other via a, uh, a screen is that it's much easier to show animations now than it was back in the 20th century. Uh, you would have needed to set up a, a film strip projector back in the 60s to show a simple diagram like this that helps illustrate why we see different phases of the moon. And so uh, for young folks or just beginning astronomers, I always like to point out, 
everything in outer space has a daytime side where the sun is shining and a nighttime side where the sun isn't shining. That's true of the Earth. That's true of the moon. That's true of all the other planets and all the other planets' moons. But because we're living here on the Earth, and almost all of us are going to spend our entire lives on this one planet, we only get the Earth's view of what's going on in the sky. And so when we look at our moon, we see different amounts of the moon's daytime and nighttime sides. And which amount we're seeing, whether it's all daytime, all nighttime, or a little bit of both, that'll determine what moon phase we're seeing. And I just love this animation because it sums it up really fast. And here's the exact same thing, but kind of looking down from above on the North Pole. As the moon goes around the Earth, an orbit that takes about a moon, about 29 days, we Earthlings get to see a different amount of its daytime and nighttime side. And so we call that the moon's phases. It's kind of cool. And so if you look on the left of this animation, you'll also notice that as it goes through its phases, sometimes Earthlings are looking into the sunshine at, at the moon, and sometimes we're looking away from the sunshine at the moon. And that also kind of shares whether or not you're going to see the moon in the daytime or in the nighttime, which is particularly useful when you're uh, trying to view the moon through a telescope. It's much, much easier, and you get a much clearer picture looking at the moon at night than you do trying to look at the moon in the daytime with that sunlight sort of photobombing it and outshining it. Ah, good stuff. So here's essentially that same animation condensed into one diagram. And I swear this diagram is in all of the uh, astronomy books and uh, earth science books. Kind of shows the moon doing a little cartoon orbit around the earth. And then below it, it matches what each phase of the moon looks like as it goes through that cycle. And so it reads from left to right through time. So it'll go to new and then it'll grow to something called a waxing crescent first quarter onto a full moon. And then for two weeks after the full moon, the moon appears to be shrinking. It looks like it's going on a diet and it's waning down ever so slightly. So that's kind of handy. And I think that's what a lot of us uh, are forced to memorize when we're kids. But if I could only force people to memorize one thing about the moon phases, it would be not this diagram so much as a handy mnemonic, a handy memory aid that has always helped me out. Ooh. And that's uh, for those of us here in the Northern Hemisphere, I'm assuming everybody here at our uh, program is going to be watching it from somewhere in uh, North America. The phase, the order of the moon phases goes from that, grows to full, and then shrinks. So if you want to get fancy, that's called first quarter, then full, then third quarter. But the way I prefer to think of it is to think about which letter of the alphabet it looks like. It starts off shaped like a D, grows until it's full, like a letter O, and then starts to shrink so it's more like a letter C. So if everybody only memorized one thing about the moon phases, it would be, for me, the DOC doc uh, pattern that the moon phases go through. This is so useful. It helps so much when you look at the moon and you catch a glimpse of it one day. And if you notice that it's kind of shaped like a letter D, then you'll say, ah, well, tomorrow the moon will be a little bit bigger and fatter. Between D and O, it's growing until it's uh, a full moon. And if you happen to catch a glimpse of the moon some morning and it looks like a letter C, you know that it's waning and shrinking. And the next day you'll see even less of that moon because it's shrinking down from C to darn near invisibility. So DOC, oh, so great. That's going to be the answer to just about any question I ask of you fine folks. So when can we see these moon phases? I think that would be a lot more helpful than just the standard diagram we always get. So if you kind of overlay it, the time of the moon phases around new moon, so between third quarter and first quarter, that's when we see the moon in the daytime, more or less. And the other half of the month, that's when we see more of the moon at night. So this kind of makes sense if you think about it. Anybody who saw the full moon yesterday probably noticed that the full moon rises right when the sun sets. So you will only ever see a full moon at night or right at sunset and sunrise. Some of these uh, other moons, like the ones that are half lit up, a, a quarter moon, a third quarter or first quarter moon, you'll see those about half and half in the daytime and in the nighttime and little skinny crescents you'll pretty much only see those during the daytime. 
So that's kind of handy that there's one half of this that happens in the daytime and one half of this that's more in the nighttime. And it'll follow that DOC pattern as it goes through its phases. Oh, good stuff. But this one here is my all time favorite diagram. And I'm a man who likes his diagrams because this kind of shows you the more practical view uh, that you can expect to see of what the moon will look like right after sunset. And I don't know about you folks, but right after sunset is when I tend to do most of my stargazing. So if I'm going out stargazing, I'm less interested in what the moon looks like at three o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon. What does the moon phase look like right at sunset? And so this diagram, I love it because it summarizes all of that. And if you're anywhere here in North America, if you face towards the south, the moon will always be on the south half of our sky if you live in North America. And that's also a handy uh, scout trick if you're ever trying to locate south by uh, what's in the sky and you don't have a handy compass telling you where south is, well, the moon will appear more or less on the south half of the sky. And that nice line between light and shadow on a half lit up moon, that line will always point you right down towards the southern horizon. Super helpful. But so in this diagram, it's a little bit weird because time goes by in this diagram from right to left kind of the opposite of the way we're used to reading these things. So and there's a new moon. It's very hard to see the, uh, the moon, and it'll be right just next to where the sun is setting. And then just a few days after that, early in the month, the first few uh, nights of the moon cycle, you can catch a low crescent moon right above where the sun is setting. If you've ever seen a great little fingernail sized uh, moon setting uh, right above where the setting sun is, then you know you caught it right at the beginning of its uh, moon cycle. And every day after that, right, it'll go through the DOC pattern. Since the uh, curvy part of the moon is on the right, it's shaped more like a letter D. So every day after that, the moon will appear to be a little bit fatter and a little bit brighter. It'll also appear to be a little bit farther away from the setting sun. So by the time you get to night seven, seven nights after a new moon, seven nights into the cycle, by the time the sun sets, the moon is basically halfway up in the middle of the sky. And seven nights after that, you've gotten to your full moon. And just when the sun is setting, the full moon is rising. So if you really like seeing the moon right after sunset, you don't feel like staying up way past midnight or getting up early in the morning, then the first two weeks of the moon cycle are the best time for you. If you want to see the moon in the early evening, then try to catch it between new moon and full moon. Some of those nights will give you uh, your better view than having to stay up way past midnight. So I just laid a bunch of information on you, but now I'd like to hear what you folks think. So we're going to give you kind of a moon phase quiz, which has five amazing parts. We're going to show you a photo of the moon and see if you guys can help us figure out what phase of the moon uh, we're looking at and what that means about what the moon's going to look like. So if you want to try and answer, go ahead and type in in the chat, and I'm going to rely on uh, Kaylee to help me out. Or if you're feeling bold, we can try a, uh, a selective unmuting here. So here's a photo of the moon, and it's in between some office buildings surrounded by a fairly blue sky. So my first question is, do you think this photo was taken in the daytime or the nighttime? And now, all right, seeing that in the chats, everybody's thinking, okay, yeah, this is a daytime moon. And then what kind of a phase are we looking at here? And this is where I think, remember the uh, thing that I wanted everybody to remember was the DOC pattern to the moon. What letter of the alphabet does this uh, resemble? Our friends in the chat have pointed out. It's shaped like a letter D. Well done, Joan. Absolutely. So this is a D. It's at the start of its, uh, towards the start of its cycle. This is a, a first quarter moon. And if you just to kind of apply common sense, look at this photo of the, uh, the moon. You can tell that the sun is up and to the right in the image because that's the side of the moon that's lit up and the shadowy side is kind of facing down into the left. So if this is a letter D shaped moon, tomorrow the moon will be even fatter. It'll still waxing, it's still growing. So tomorrow you'll get an even bigger uh, view of this, uh, of the moon. 
And this also kind of hints that the moon is rising because you can see that the uh, shiny part of the moon is facing upwards, right where the sun is. So the shiny part of the moon is going up. And this is a rising nearly first quarter moon photographed in the daytime. So if you got that, pat yourselves on the back. You guys are awesome. And you passed the first part of our, our moon quiz. Okay, on to moon quiz two. And hopefully this will be the easy one. All right, anybody recognize this moon phase or want to weigh in on whether this was taken in the daytime or the nighttime? Nicely done. Oh, everybody's getting this one. Well played, yeah. So this is a full moon taken at night. You'll only see a full moon at night. So this is probably just rising past those trees. I'm guessing those trees are on the ground and not up in the middle of the sky. So this is probably taken right when the sun was setting and the full moon was rising. Oh, nice. And here the moon's gone from a letter D and now it's grown to a letter O. So you can probably guess what I'm going to show you next. Aha. When was this taken? Daytime, nighttime? I like this. We're kind of playing moon CSI with these photos. So this moon looks like it's shaped like a letter C. And if you remember the moon cycle goes D, then O, then C. So this is well after a full moon. Oh, the chat is lighting up. You've got it. So Jones got it. This was taken early in the morning or very late at night. I won't uh, to stretch a point. And it's definitely a crescent, but let's see, is this waxing or waning? Well, since it's shaped like a letter C, we know that this is the end of the cycle. Things have shrunk from an O down to a letter C, and it's going to keep shrinking or waning as the, uh, the term has it. And you can also kind of tell that this is early in the morning, because if you look at the bottom left corner of the photo, you can tell the sky is much brighter over there that the sun is just about to rise. And in fact, the shiny part of the moon is pointing down into the left. That's where the sun is coming up. So this moon is about, yeah, halfway up the sky. The sun is just about to rise. This is a waning crescent moon taken just before sunrise. Ah, oh, in those wee hours when uh, I certainly don't like to be awake. Well done. All right, and one last one. Here's a photo of the moon with some very nice scenery. In fact, it might even be tricky to spot where in this picture the moon is. It's kind of in the upper left corner of the photo. And then I'd ask, what letter of the alphabet does this most resemble? And I can sense somebody thinking, ah, yes. This thing totally looks like a letter D. That means this is towards the beginning of its cycle. And the sun is to the right, right where the shiny side of this moon is pointed. This is still in the daytime, but you can see the shadows from the trees are getting kind of long. This is right before sunset on one of those days near a first quarter moon when you can just kind of catch the moon in the daytime, in the afternoon. Well, nicely done. You folks put up with my nonsense. So here's our very last moon uh, phase quiz. Here's a moon that's a little bit hard to see because this photo was definitely taken in the daytime. And it's shaped more like a letter C than like a letter D. So the moon has gone from D to O to C. This is after full. This is a third quarter moon or possibly a, a waning crescent that part of the month. And you can see from the shiny side of the moon that it's pointed up and to the left. That's where the sun is. This is just about midday. And this moon is getting lower towards near where those mountains are. This moon is about to set. So this is one other last bit of a forensic investigation you could do on this photograph. You can tell that this road faces towards where the moon is setting. That means this road points west. Nobody asked you for that information, but it's a fun little bit of trivia that you can tell just by looking at it. It's like, oh, okay, this was taken in mid-morning and you're facing west, wherever this nice mountain road is. Whew. Go ahead, you can wipe the sweat off your brow. You folks have made it through our amazing moon quiz. So <laughs> we'll understand if you wanna uh, keep things muted so that nobody hears our, uh, our dogs throwing a fit. So what if you wanted to find out the current moon phase? 
There are any number of great sources out there uh, that it caters specifically to astronomy. But also, if it's a cloudy day and you've lost track of what uh, phase the moon is in, uh, a handy thing is to just pick up a newspaper. So I, I scanned this in. This is from uh, the weather page on a, a Plain Dealer uh, newspaper from uh, just a few days ago. And in amongst all the other fun weather forecasts, there are my two favorite items in the weather report. There's a list of the moon phases for the current month. And then if you check the fine prints up above the hourly forecast, it even tells you when sunrise, sunset, moonrise, and moonset are. It's a very handy bit of information all in one place. And it's usually pretty easy to get your hands on a newspaper if you've completely lost track of what moon phase you're in. Good stuff. Uh, and then on the right, I showed um, from an online version of uh, the News Herald uh, newspapers. From, well, it's from their website, not from the print edition. And they get their weather information from AccuWeather. And this was for the same day, but it shows one of the pitfalls you can run into when trying to get information about the moon. And I'll mention this again later, in that it doesn't tell you the moon phase, but it has a little cartoon moon there. And I think that's just a cartoon that represents the fact that it's telling you the nighttime temperature. It doesn't necessarily mean that the moon will be in that phase in a, a C-shaped uh, waning crescent moon. So that's one of those honest mistakes you can run into is if just because a, uh, uh, an app gives you a cartoon image of a moon doesn't necessarily mean that they're telling you that's the current moon phase. Oh, good stuff. And if you wanna take one more step and get some other great information about the current moon phase, uh, one of my favorite websites is called Time and Date. And uh, it's in that collection of uh, links that I uh, shared in the chat feature at the beginning. It will tell you not only the current moon phase, but uh, you can look months and months into the future or in the past. So if just for trivia's sake, you want to look up what the uh, moon phase was like uh, when you were born, it's a handy almanac for using that information. The only thing you have to be careful of is because it's a website, it caters to the entire planet. So the first thing you need to do when you go there is specify where you are or you'll end up, who knows, getting uh, um, the phase, the moon phases as seen from Australia or someplace where they uh, look different from what we see. So yeah, just make sure you specify where on earth you are. And then if you want to take one more step into uh, getting the details about the moon, the go-to uh, magazine for 21st century uh, amateur astronomy is the Handy Sky and Telescope magazine. And it's in most of the libraries, and if not, in uh, print, if you ask any librarian, they'll uh, show you how to read it online. It's a, a very handy resource. And right in the middle of every month's issue, there's this great star chart, which always includes, like I've shown in this photo, a handy moon almanac showing you what the moon's phases will be throughout the month. So those are uh, two handy online resources. And then if you want to go one step further, I can't resist it because I love these. If you have access to a printer and want to do a little bit of a paper craft, there is a handy activity that uh, NASA's JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory publishes, where they make an entire wheel of moon phases for each calendar year. And by doing a little cutting and uh, hole punching, you can make yourself a twisty, moon phase calendar and i kind of like it because it'll show you what moon the phase the moon is in for every day of the year and about where you can look for it uh when it's rising and setting it's kind of fun the only downside to is it to it is it'll only last for a whole calendar year so if you come back in 2022 you'll have to print out a next uh, a new one but uh they're really good about updating it every year if we were meeting in person, this is something I would have had us all do as a fun paper craft. But hey, it's virtual, so we make do. Nice. I put this one in just in case anybody asked about the fine print. I said before the moon's orbit takes about 29 days, give or take, but I left out some of the details. So one way to measure it, because we live on planet Earth, is if you measure the moon's position from passing one particular star, let's say uh, the red eye of Taurus the bull, Aldebaran, if you measure it, the time it takes to pass that star 
and to pass that star again, that takes just over 27 days. But if you live on planet Earth and you want to watch the moon's cycle compared to the sun, the star that I care the most about as an Earthling, that amount of time works out to be just over 29 days. So you may hear uh, somewhere out there on you know sources that they're talking about a 27-day cycle of the moon. But to be honest, we Earthlings will almost always see it as a 29-day cycle because we're watching it compared to the... Uh, to the sun. Nicely done. So like we said, they those moon phases repeat ooh, every 29 days, but that also helps you predict when the next full moon will be. So I left in an exercise from last October. Uh, there was kind of a, an interesting uh, phenomenon with the moon. There was a full moon on October 2nd of 2020. So for those of you who are good at math or happen to be watching this with a pencil, when was the next full moon? If they happen every 29 days or so, if there was one on October 2nd, the next one should have been 31. So there was a full moon on the night of October the 31st, which is kind of cool because that's Halloween night. And also cool because that meant there were two full moons within one calendar month. That's kind of neat because our modern calendar moons aren't exactly the same as the moon cycle. Some of them are 31 days, so it's possible when things are just right for you to get two full moons inside of one 31-day long calendar month. Kind of cool. And for no good reason, folks call that a blue moon, even though, as you can see from this nifty photo from my second favorite city on Earth, Cincinnati, that the moon isn't actually blue. So if I were in charge of the names, we would stop calling these blue moons and we would call them like double moons or extra moons. Oh, it's kind of that one of those fun little surprises. Like when you end up with, you know, five Sundays in a month or three payrolls in a certain calendar month. Sometimes you get two full moons within a certain month. And some people use an even more bizarre definition where a blue moon is when you get the third full moon in a season which contains four moon, full moons. And the short answer is uh, there's really no good reason why anybody would do that. I personally don't get too excited about the other definition of a blue moon because you've got to have a very uh, actuarial mindset to actually uh, think that's a special occasion. Ah, oh, good stuff. So, but this is a, a great excuse to talk about lunar calendars because our modern calendar is based on the sun and the moon. So all of our months in the modern calendar are different lengths. Some are 31 days, some are 30. One of them is 28 days, except when it's 29 days. It's a mess. But there are other calendar systems that stress the moon. Oh, nice. Like I wanted to, to showcase uh, the Miami nation, the Mia Mia uh, folks have uh, this amazing lunar calendar, which uh, they've done a great job of preserving and sharing online. So uh, they're the Miami Nation, traditionally lived in Western Ohio and Eastern uh, Indiana until the removal area where, uh, era when uh, most of them were uh, forced to migrate to what's now Oklahoma. So you might find uh, a whole lot of information about the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, but they're also run the Miami Center at uh, Miami University in Western Ohio, where uh, Professor George Ironstack still issues every year a, uh, a, an up-to-date version of the traditional Miami lunar calendar, which I think is a great use of the internet to preserve traditional knowledge. So here's a page from the current uh, moon uh, cycle. So if you look, it has um, the days of the modern Gregorian calendar at the bottom of each day square. And then the traditional Miami timekeeping is uh, in larger print on the upper right. So yesterday, that full moon that we just experienced, which is called October the 20th in the modern standard calendar, was actually the night of the 13th and 14th of the smoky burning moon in uh, the Miami traditional calendar which is kind of uh, another amazing uh, link to Ohio's natural heritage because you get to find out uh, what was happening in uh, the Miami culture's 
uh, uh, cycle of the year, what uh, activities in nature were they engaged in at that time of the year? So the time of year that we nowadays call uh, October would have been the time for lighting fires and clearing land uh, to uh, get that done before uh, the onset of winter. So it's kind of fun. A, a lunar calendar can teach you a lot more about what's going on in nature than just the, uh, the handy bit of the moon phase. Uh, and one other one uh, that uh, people interact with uh, a lot nowadays are uh, the traditional Hebrew calendar, which is based on the moon rather than our, our modern one. So if you ever wonder why uh, Jewish holidays seem to slide around in the modern calendar, it's because they're assigned based on a calendar that's based on the moon. And so my favorite way to show the distinction between a lunar calendar and a solar calendar is by picking a random day from history. So I picked one uh, June the 21st, 1556. Now, if you ask what season that was, we know because any June in the Gregorian calendar, you know that's going to be the beginning of summer. So June the 21st, 1556, even though I don't know anything about that year in history, I know that in the Gregorian calendar, June 21st is always summertime. So this was the beginning of uh, summer. But then if you ask yourself, Okay, well, what was the moon's phase on June 21st, 1556? I have absolutely no idea. The Gregorian calendar doesn't tell you anything about the moon. Because like I said, it's much more interested in the cycle of the sun. Now contrast that with the traditional Hebrew calendar. If we pick a random date, ooh, like the 4th of Tammuz in 5,316. And then we ask ourselves the same question, what season was that? The short answer is, I have no idea because the months of the lunar calendar move around compared to the cycle of the sun. But if we ask what was the moon's phase, I can answer that exactly. Because the fourth of Tammuz will have been the fourth day of a new moon cycle. That means it was a waxing crescent moon. It's kind of cool. So what your calendar tells you about what's going on in the sky really just tells you about what a certain culture prioritizes in uh, recording in it. And so uh, these actually these dates aren't actually completely random. These are actually two ways of writing the exact same dates. So uh, I picked a summer date in uh, a random period of history and then found the, the date in both calendars. So 4th of Tammuz, 5,316 is the same as June the 21st, 1556. There. So now you get to uh, show that uh, to all of your favorite uh, history buffs when you meet them next. Nice. So there's a few other bits of fine print that I should share about uh, the moon's uh, phases. And one is that the view we get on the left is the only view that we earthlings get because we're gonna spend our lives for the most of our part trapped on this little bubble of rock and air that we call the earth. So we're only gonna to get to see the moon from one point in space, the earth. Whereas the image on the right is a composite of photos over the course of a month taken by a spaceship. In this case, it was the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's like a weather satellite that photographs the moon. And it shows that the moon rotates over the course of a month, over a, the course of a moon cycle. But because we're stuck here on the earth, we only get to see one side of the moon, oh, which can be really frustrating. So it turns out like a lot of moons, the moon always turns, keeps one side, the same side facing the earth. And on my handy moon globe, I'll hold that up to the uh, camera. That's the side that we see all the time with the familiar light and dark patterns that we call the man in the moon or the bunny rabbit on the moon, whatever you want to imagine on the moon. The other side faces away, and the part that's unseen by Earthlings is pretty creatively called the far side of the moon, except when it isn't. Oh, nice. So like I said, we Earthlings can only see the one side. So through all of human history, up until about 1959, no human had ever seen the far side of the moon, the side of the moon that never turns itself towards the Earth. And in order to see that, humans had to send spaceships at first robots around the far side of the moon to send some photos back. And that's what we're seeing here. That was the first ever picture of the moon's far side taken by the Luna 3 probe back in 1959. 
which was doubly cool because one, it was a photo of the far side, and two, it was taken with one of them newfangled digital cameras, which was pretty a big, a pretty big deal in 1959. So nowadays, spacecraft have gotten much better, clear photos of the far side. There's there it is, a photo of what it looks like. And the short answer is it looks a lot like the rest of the moon, just with uh, fewer of those big dark areas that are called uh, seas. And on the right is one of my other favorite photos of the far side of the moon. It's taken by uh, a different satellite. This one's called the Discover satellite. Its job is to orbit out beyond the moon and it takes a photo of the entire earth several times a day, all day, every day. It's a weather satellite that tries to literally get the big picture. But every once in a while, while it's photographing the Earth, it'll get photobombed by the moon. So I just like that. It took a picture of the far side of the moon creeping in between it and planet Earth. Kind of fun. It was a, a little sort of eclipse that only applied to that particular satellite. But if we're talking about the far side of the moon, I have to address this uh, common misconception that we're left with. So in 1973, the British rock band Pink Floyd released the album Dark Side of the Moon. And anybody who in the English speaking world who was alive in 1973 would never ever again speak the words far side of the moon. It was always, oh, the dark side of the moon, which unfortunately led to uh, a slightly confusing uh, problem. And then later on, I did like this other cultural artifact Starting in 1979, cartoonist Gary Larson began publishing a comic called The Far Side. And as far as I can tell, every late 20th century scientist had at least one Far Side cartoon hanging on their uh, office. And so that kind of brought the phrase The Far Side back into, uh, into uh, English speaking, in the English speaking world. Because the dark side of the moon and the far side of the moon are not the same thing. The far side of the moon is that side of the moon that faces away from the Earth, the side that we Earthlings never see. Whereas the dark side of the moon is just a fancy way of saying nighttime. Just like the Earth has a light side and a dark side. And right now, we, you and I, live on the dark side of the Earth because it's nighttime. It is kind of fun. You can tell people, oh, I'll see you at 7.30 tonight on the dark side of the Earth. So yeah, it's uh, very easy to get confused about the dark side of the moon versus the far side of the moon. They're not the same thing. Oh, good stuff. But speaking of the moon going dark, I've got to bring up those cool special events. So you remember that first picture that I showed you right at the beginning and I told you something was a little bit odd with the moon? If you're sharp eyed, you might have noticed that this moon is going a little bit dark, but it's going dark in a way that it doesn't normally. So this is actually a photo of an eclipse. So when the moon goes through its phases, the darkness will pass in this photo from kind of along the left-right axis. But in this case, the darkness is coming up from the bottom, which was a clue that this photo was not just showing the nighttime side of the moon. This is a lunar eclipse in progress. What's happening here is the Earth's shadow is starting to block the moon. Kind of cool. And like I mentioned, you picked a great time to learn about the moon because we have a lunar eclipse coming up next month. Mark your calendars. On November the 19th, 2021, we are going to get a very nice looking lunar eclipse. So cross your fingers that we get clear weather that night because if it's raining, it'll be very hard to see it. So here's a quick preview of what that eclipse is going to look like. So... Um, if you look up on the internet, uh, it'll say, yeah, the eclipse is on November the 19th, but I should put out an important caveat. There's a, uh, a potential mistake to be made here. It happens very early in the morning, starting at about two o'clock in the morning. So I find it helps to think of it as being Thursday night, Friday morning, rather than saying, if you just look up and said, oh, eclipse, Friday, November 19th. If you go out at sunset on Friday, November the 19th, you've missed the eclipse. The eclipse is going to be at two in the morning on Friday, November the 19th. So yeah, I prefer to think of it as Thursday night, Friday morning, not Friday night, Saturday morning. And so we, it'll last about four hours. So even if the clouds come and go, we should get a good view of it. 
But if you don't want to stay up all night, um, you're welcome to just view the most dramatic part should be between 2.30 a.m. and 4.30 a.m. So if you're willing to stay up a little late on the early morning hours of Friday, November the 19th, it's totally worth the show. And even if that one doesn't work out, we get another eclipse, not coincidentally, six months after that. Ooh. But this eclipse is going to be a blood moon, oh. which is a fun name that people give to a lunar eclipse when they want to sound a little bit more dramatic because lunar eclipse sounds kind of humdrum and oh, every day, but blood moon sounds magical and amazing. And I included a photo of the last time we saw a blood moon. This is, again, another snapshot that I took just holding a cell phone up to a, a telescope. And then on the right, my favorite fictional rendition of a blood moon. Uh, if you mention a blood moon to anybody under the age of 20, their minds immediately go to this popular Disney cartoon called Big City Greens, which featured an episode in which the blood moon brought madness and uh, animal attacks in a cartoonish uh, comedy style. It's kind of fun, but I like it because it sort of sums up the uh, attitude that mo fo most folks have to these eclipses and blood moons, that it must be something horrifying and ominous. Oh, nice. But in reality, here's a quick overview of that. Over the course of a few hours, this just means that the Earth's shadow covers up most of the moon. And once it gets a little bit darker, the only light from the Earth that reaches it is tinted that sunset orange color. So it just means that instead of being 100% dark, it's usually a little bit tinted red, which is kind of fun. So by all means, go out and enjoy this. But uh, calling it a blood moon and getting yourself worked into a frenzy is maybe going a bit far. But it's absolutely worth seeing. So for me, the big question about eclipse is when I was a kid, is okay, I get it. An eclipse occurs, and I brought my handy model to show this, when the Earth and the Moon are lined up just right so that the Earth's shadow covers up the Moon. Okay, great. But then why don't we get a, uh, an eclipse every month? because it takes one month for this orbit to go around. Why isn't there just an eclipse and then two weeks later, another eclipse, and then two weeks later, eclipse after eclipse after eclipse? Well, for one thing, if that happened, I don't think we would even get out of bed to watch them. They would be so uh, routine. But the other thing is that there's a slight tilt to the moon's orbit compared to the Earth's orbit around the sun. And it's about five degrees, which I actually exaggerated here in this little uh, cartoon. It's five degrees looks a lot less a lot, a lot closer to flat than this cartoon that I drew. And so because of that, most of the time when the sun, earth, and moon are almost perfectly lined up, they're not exactly lined up in a perfectly straight line. And so the earth's shadow will be a little bit below or a little bit above the moon, and we won't get an eclipse. So it works out that we can only get these, not every single full moon, but only about once or twice a year. And not coincidentally, they tend to happen about half a year apart. So that orange photo I showed you before was from this past May, when we had our last partial uh, eclipse of the moon. And then six months after May comes November, we're getting another lunar eclipse. And then six months after this November, next May, we're going to get yet another eclipse. It's kind of fun. So... Uh, we've, uh, again, written these dates down in that handy set of links that I sent you before, so you don't need to scribble these all down. The short answer is yes, we're getting a good lunar eclipse this November and an even better lunar eclipse in May of 2022. And just for fun, I thought I'd mention the next few solar eclipses, though we're not getting any good solar eclipses for the rest of 2021 or 2022. It'll have to wait until October of 2023 to see a good solar eclipse. And the last solar eclipse we got is that uh, snapshot I put on the lower right. That was from this past June, June of 2021. If you got up right at sunrise, we had a partial eclipse. So that's a, a photo from the, um, what is it, Painesville Township Park, where there's that great pier that goes out into Lake Erie. So we took a group out to the end of the pier to get photos of the, uh, the moon, right when it, uh, the sun, right when it was rising. Oh, good stuff.
So like I said, mark your calendars because those eclipses are worth seeing and I can't reschedule them because nature sets the dates. Good stuff. So for this blood moon panic, I thought was a, a good enough uh, reason that I should share a few other bits of uh, moon myths, misconceptions and mayhem because humans like to uh, overreact to uh, the things about the moon and its influence on us. So I thought it'd be a good time to set the record straight about a few uh, bits of moon mania. Because it's not all um, all the, the mistakes or misconceptions we have about the moon. Some of them are, are just innocent mistakes. Others are illusions where our senses are cheating us. And then some of them are outright lies and scams. So uh, like I said, there are innocent mistakes like that AccuWeather report I showed you before where it just has a cartoon moon to indicate nighttime. So it's not deliberately telling you the wrong moon phase. It's just there to be an icon and represent nighttime. Innocent mistakes are things like confusing the dark side of the moon and the far side of the moon. It's easily done and people have been doing it since the 1970s. And so, yeah, it can be hard to keep those straight. And one other mistake would be uh, the folks who think that a blue moon is actually going to look blue. I mean, if people call it a blue moon, it's reasonable to assume that the moon would be blue. But in truth, a blue moon is just a trick of the calendar. And I don't know why we keep using the term blue moon. If we would just stop and start calling those blue moon phenomena something else, nobody would expect the moon to literally turn blue. Now, one of these, though, I want to get on to the innocent mistakes that's particularly apparel in the internet age is finding information about the moon online that's either out of date or out of place. So you might go online and it might say, ooh, there's going to be a lunar eclipse on December 4th. And if it doesn't tell you the year, that might have been true years ago. But if it, anybody ever tells you there's going to be a lunar eclipse on a certain date and they don't tell you the year, you might want to double check the year and make sure this is you know, old information because stuff on the internet lives forever. The other trick you can get, especially when you're uh, dealing with uh, things on the internet, is that things for a global audience might not reflect where you are. So there might be, say, an eclipse that's only visible from Australia. And so sources on the internet will say, oh, great, lunar eclipse on this particular date. But if they don't mention that it's going to be visible from North America, you might want to sit that one out. <laughs> so I included my favorite uh, out of place information uh, kind of potential mix up here in uh, a nifty movie from a while back from the famous movie, the Lord of the Rings. There's a scene where the wizard uh, summons the moon to uh, reflect onto a, uh, a magical doorway, and they then cut to this shot of the moon on the right, which you might notice looks a little bit odd. It doesn't look like the moon that you and I see. And that's because the Lord of the Rings movies were filmed in New Zealand, where they get a view of the moon that looks upside down by Ohio standards. So here's an Ohio view of the moon superimposed next to the Southern Hemisphere's view of the moon. So I just kind of like that. The moon looks different from different places on the earth, which is why I took the uh, game the fine Britain to specify that everything I mentioned earlier today is about the way we see the moon from here in Ohio or the Northern hemisphere. It's kind of cool. So like I said, just because you read it online doesn't mean it applies this year in North America. Always good to double check those things. So on from the uh, out of date or out of place information, there's also you know, ways your senses can cheat. Uh, in particular about how big the moon looks. So here's a photo of the moon rising next to mountains and trees. <laughs> and so when we humans see the moon rising, we tend to think it looks much bigger than it is. And then it's easy to exploit that. Like uh, if you see the moon next to a house or a, a giant tree, your mind just thinks, oh, that thing's enormous. And then a few hours later, when it gets higher up in the sky and there's nothing around it for comparison, your mind will say, oh yeah, that looks about right. That's about how big the moon should be. But the moon isn't you know, growing and shrinking like a balloon. And it's certainly not moving closer to the earth and farther away over the course of a few hours or even over the course of a month. The truth is it's just kind of our senses cheating us. And there's a great way to dispel it. So here in the camera view, I'm holding up my favorite tool for 
giving yourself the moon sanity check. And that is a paper drinking straw. And not only can you use these to drink lemonade and make all kinds of cool crafts, but you can also use it as a telescope. Ooh. And if you hold it up to your eye and very carefully promise not to poke yourself in the eye, <clears throat> one of the fun things is you can also use these to win uh, bets with your easily impressed friends because no matter what, you can always see the entire moon through a straw this size. They're usually about a quarter inch in diameter. Even when it's a full moon, even when it's a super moon, even when the moon is really, really close to the earth, it's still so tiny, it will always fit in this straw. And you can bet your friends, aha, I bet the moon will fit in this straw. And they'll say, no way, it's too big. But it totally does. So then you can uh, win yourself a straw. So yeah, it's a great way to kind of remind your mind that the moon hasn't gotten much bigger. It's just putting it in context uh, that uh, helps our mind come back to reality. Okay, so those are the honest mistakes and the ways your senses can cheat you. And the unfortunate truth is there's also a lot of hype and outright lies going around about the moon. So we unfortunately have to be uh, good uh, media consumers when we're learning about the moon. So I put in my favorite cartoon huckster here, the character of Stan from the uh, Disney cartoon uh, Gravity Falls. So these can show up in things as recently as, do you remember the saga of the ever given cargo ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal? So yeah, one of the reasons it was able to get freed, some people went around thanking the moon because in addition to all the very hard work that people put in digging a, a channel for it to get out, there's also the fact that the moon causes the tides and the tides rose ever so slightly. And that uh, was one of the factors that helped get that cargo ship unstuck from the Suez Canal. But then folks kind of tended to overhype it and say, oh, the moon helped pull this cargo ship out of the canal which is taking things a bit far. There's a little bit of truth to it, but it uh, overhypes it. Or another thing that has a tiny grain of truth to it, but that gets very much overhyped is the phenomenon of supermoons. And nobody used the phrase supermoon before the 1970s when folks kind of needed a way to make the full moon more interesting and exciting. And the truth is if you get paid by the click you'll always be tempted to hype things up and make people, people think that something is special and unique and unmissable. And so if we just said, hey, there's a full moon tonight, go out and enjoy it because it's great. That generates fewer clicks than saying, it's a super moon, go out and see it. It'll be 10 times the size it normally is. And I've shown in this nifty diagram that the Adler Planetarium in Chicago whipped up there's not much of a difference in how the biggest possible moon and the smallest possible moon looks compared to one another. I'm sorry, they'll both still fit into a paper straw. So a super moon is a great time to look at the moon. A micro moon is exactly as good of a time to go and observe the full moon. And then one other bit of a uh, moon hype was this uh, article I ran across earlier it was the science scientists expect the moon's wobble to lift the earth's to, uh, lift tides as though this were something new and shocking and it even mentions oh the moon wobble was first reported in 1728 which is a little bit less than the whole truth so the truth is the moon has its monthly cycle and it has goes along with the earth for its annual cycle around the uh around the sun but there's also another cycle. You remember I mentioned the moon's orbit is tilted slightly compared to the Earth's, and that five degree tilt explains why we don't see an eclipse every single month. So people have known about that for as long as we've known about eclipses. This goes back centuries, even millennia. But uh, the fact that we're coming up on uh, one of these times of the orbital cycle where the moon appears to rise very far to the north it can have a very, very, very slight, and by slight, I mean like less than 5% effect on the height of the ocean tides. So folks are saying, oh, the moon's going to make the, uh, the tides suddenly so much greater, which makes it sound like it's going to be some kind of a disaster movie. But in fact, the effect is very slight, and it's been well known, not just for centuries, but for millennia. Uh, in fact, it's a phenomenon called a lunar standstill, which a lot of languages have in their old versions. It's a concept that's been in Old English 
for thousands and thousands of years. So this is literally nothing new. And my favorite example of how not new this cycle is, is uh, an archeological site near Newark, Ohio, which is creatively called the Newark Earthworks. There's a photo of it on the right and a drawing of it in the, on the left. And it's this huge multi-acre uh, set of uh, earthworks, earthen walls that are about six to eight feet tall and they stretch for hundreds and hundreds of feet. It's an amazing historical site to go visit, but it's aligned with this cycle that the moon goes through. If you live on planet earth over a cycle of about 18 years as the moon's orbit goes through that tilt compared to the earth's orbit, it'll make mean that you see the moon rise in different positions on your horizon. And so they aligned this huge earthen structure with the northernmost possible point of the moon's rise, a point that it only reaches about once every 18 and a half years, which is kind of cool. But I also love pointing to this giant ancient uh, monument that was built sometime around 200 to 400 AD as the proof that the moon cycle uh, is absolutely, this absolutely nothing new. So sorry, you can try to dress it up as news, but the ancient Ohioans knew about this centuries and centuries ago. So if you really want to get the details, the next uh, major standstill is coming up in April of 2025, and the moon's going to be rising a little bit farther north on the horizon ever so slightly until then. Again, worth visiting the Newark Earthworks to learn about this, but no need to worry about it suddenly making the tides much more uh, large and dangerous. Phew. All right. So we've confronted some of the myths, myths, conceptions, lies, and mania that we can get about the moon. But the cool thing is we're always learning some new things about the moon. Our knowledge of the moon is always going to be incomplete. There are always cool new details to get. And my favorite way to get people uh, learning about the moon is just go out and observe it yourself. Try and watch it every day over the course of an entire moon cycle. If you can use the uh, library's binoculars or telescopes to get an up-close view, so much the better. And so to go along with that, I'm going to wrap up by sharing my favorite uh, bits of where to go for more information. So again, these are all in that handy set of links that we shared in the chat feature. But if you only read one book about the moon, I highly recommend 50 Things to See on the Moon, which is great. It's uh, new. It was only about two years old. It recommends uh, viewing targets for every day of the moon cycle. It is my favorite thing to have next to me when I'm uh, looking at the moon through a telescope. And by an amazing coincidence, the only copy of this in the entire Clevenet library system is from the Mentor Public Library. So I promise I will put this in the return slot tomorrow and you folks can start checking it out. It's a great one. Another one that's uh, handy and a little more pocket-sized is the Firefly Moon Observer's Guide. Uh, they just put out a new edition in 2015. It's got some old information about film photography that's a little out of date, but everything it says about the moon itself on what you can see each day of the cycle is still perfectly uh, valid and still a great resource. I highly recommend that book. And so there are all those things that I mentioned online before from the time and date service to the list of all the upcoming uh, eclipses of the moon. These are all links that are very hard to memorize. So what I did was I typed them all up and I included them in that collection of links that I sent out through the chat feature. So nobody has to furiously scribble down these impossibly long website URLs. Phew, good stuff. <laughs>